and the president of currently he is the the president of Mongolia Society of Cardiologists. Today he want to give a, a talk about the assessment of severity of mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation by cardiac imaging. Professor Mongol Chime, please. It's me. Yeah, Hello, everybody. To I'm honored to be uh, here. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Shall we go? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you very much for um, Thank you very much for this, uh, Professor Jun Lee and Professor Rong Bin Shu, and the uh, co-chair and organizing committee for the given opportunity to attend this wonderful webinar. I'm going to talk about the mitral valve disease imaging assessment today. Okay, oh, valvular heart disease are constantly increasing over decades. The, this study on valvular heart disease a global burden during uh, then uh, involving 1990 and 2017, published on Journal of uh, Global Health on uh, 2017, here rheumatic heart disease still common incidence is not declining, and moreover, non-rheumatic valvular heart disease is increasing over decades. The incidence of non-rheumatic degenerative mitral valve disease increased 2.15 fold from. 1992 to uh, 2017. One of the latest and comprehensive study conducted in regard of presentation in the management of valvular heart disease is a result of Euro Observational Research Program of Valvular Heart Disease Second Survey, in which enrolled more than 7,200 patients from 222 centers of European countries in uh, 2017. According to this observation, severe inactive valvular heart disease was present in 72% of total enrolled patients, and of which 4.5% with the mitral stenosis and 21.3% with the mitral regurgitation. Among mitral regurgitation, 67% were with the mitral, uh, primary mitral regurgitation and 33% uh, were with the secondary mitral regurgitation, of which almost more than, more than half, uh, actually 52% was uh, classified as having ischemic mitral regurgitation. Among mitral stenosis, main cause is still rheumatic heart, uh, heart disease. Among non-rheumatic uh, valvular heart disease, two most common Calcific, uh, common uh, the disease is calcific aortic valve disease and degenerative mitral valve disease. In regard how uh, the patients were managed with uh, valvular heart disease according to the guideline, percentage of the patients with a class one recommendation for intervention in whom was scheduled or performed for aortic uh, valvular heart disease was approximately even more than 80% aortic all of this is approximately or even more than 80 percent however with the mitral uh, with uh, however much less patients were managed according to the guideline in uh, mitral with the mitral valve disease this showing that there is still worrying trend of many many patients being referred late in in the natural history of their disease for consideration of surgery of transcatheter treatment. Based on this uh, data, guideline was issued uh, in, uh, by European Society of Cardiology and jointly with the European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery in 2017. According to this guideline, patients with the valvular heart disease needs more complete evaluation. And echocardiography is the key technique used to confirm diagnosis of valvular heart disease as well as to assist its severity in prognosis. And it is also key to assist valve morphology in function, as well as to evaluate the feasibility and indication of specific intervention. This uh, is modified table uh, uh, of imaging, uh, the whole imaging of, uh, for mitral valve disease from American Journal of Cardiology in uh, 2018, published by Professor Winderlind and his team summarizes imaging tools used in 
mitral valve disease. So the TE, uh, in general, echo in uh, TE, uh, the, uh, the transthoracic echo TE in the 3D T in the MRI are more um, for the for more advantageous for functional in the volume assessment, while CT is advantageous in anatomical evaluation. This is a mechanism of development of uh, mitral, aromatic mitral stenosis versus degenerative mitral stenosis. You can see uh, development of the long-term inflammation after single or multiple episodes of rheumatic fever can lead uh, to valve dysfunction in untreated genetically predisposed patients. Leaflets are getting thickened stiff due to the high degree of fibrosis, while in degenerative mitral stenosis, occurs in all the patients with the progress of endothelial disruption with the progressive inflammation leading to thickened both leaf, uh, leaflets with the restriction of motion and calcification and calcification of the annulus. So uh, this is the order how to uh, assist uh, by uh, cardiac imaging. We have to uh, first distinguish uh, the pay attention on anatomy and function of the mitral valve. Etiology and mechanism is very important. Severity of assessment, including qualitative, semi-quantitative and quantitative approach, and prognosis and timing of abnormality uh, development, whether it's acute or chronic. Anatomical features of a different type of mitral stenosis is summarized here in this table. We go uh, by one by one. In anatomical and functional assessment of mitral stenosis, several scores are available for evaluation of mitral valve morphology. And uh, all uh, these scores consider valve thickening, mobility, calcification with a subvalvular cord fusion. Collecting scores from each category summed up with the score. Here, the example is uh, the, the presented uh, the abnormality scored with the eight score. For anatomically and functional assessment, short axis view in 2D in 3D evaluable in, in order to see commissural fusion in the rheumatic uh, mitral stenosis here, and open free commissures uh, in red arrows sh showing the free commissures in degenerative mitral stenosis, and the single leaflet in um, congenital mitral stenosis. In the left, we see the four chamber wave of echocardiogram shows a thickened mitral wall in the tip, which reduces motion in domain during the diastole. Right, the left atrial enlargement, also we, we see the right and left atrial in, in, enlargement here. And in the right, uh, we see the thickened both leaflet with the, the calcification of the annulus. In a um, short axis, we're uh, demonstrating doming of the mitral valve here in fibrotic. In the right, calcific mitral uh, posterior leaflet and with the annulus, small annulus calcification in degenerative mitral stenosis. For severity grading, need to use as much as possible methods. Planimetry, pressure half time, mean gradient, systolic pulmonary pressure are the main robust methods. PISA and continuity equation are more complex in mitral stenosis diagnosis and depends on other conditions like existence of uh, mitral regurgitation, etc. According to ESC and ECT's guideline uh, 2017, it states that valve area using planimetry is the reference measurement of mitral stenosis severity, whereas mean paravalvular gradient in pulmonary pressures reflect its consequences and have a prognostic value more. Planimetry measurement in 2D, careful cat of ultrasound by edge to edge of leaflet in order to define the least opening areas is the most important factor. Tracing by inner edge in a short axis weave in a zoom is another requirement for accuracy. You can see rheumatic is here and the degenerative is more similar um, features here. Professor Zamarano and his team in the, in the study demonstrated that uh, compared with all other ecotopal derived methods, uh, 3D planimetry had, had been had the be, uh, best agreement with uh, the invasively determined uh, mitral valve area. 
So uh, the three D planimetry in phase wave can show us more realistically definition uh, of uh, the opening of the material uh, aromatic material stenosis as well as the degenerative material stenosis than three two D images. Here we see the the severe uh, aromatic material stenosis how it looks like in the three D, and uh, while the degenerative material stenosis in in 3D as well. Another uh, the qualitative assessment is the pressure half time in the main gradients. Uh, pressure half time is the uh, must use method in the matrostenosis. Here you can see the mean gradient can be estimated by uh, in tracing transmitteral flow in uh, a continuous Doppler and also pressure half time as in the continuous Doppler as a slope estimation. All these uh, above mentioned methods uh, uh, is uh, uh, reflected in severity classification using above method. While mattress wall of area less than one centimeter square, mean uh, pressure gradient above 10, uh, pulmonary pressure more than um, 50, 60 considered to be finding for severe mattress stenosis sign. There are pitfalls. Uh, in 2D uh, planning, uh, parasternal long axis, uh, short ag long axis view, plenty, uh, short, sorry, short axis planimetry accuracy is uh, one pitfall. If cannot be a, a, a captured image edge to edge, then it will be uh, falsely estimated. In case of severe classification, it is also difficult to estimate uh, the area. And in regard of the pressure half time, it is too sensitive method and false in aortic regurgitation, presence of aortic regurgitation, left ventricle compliance dependent. That means that during diastolic dysfunction, it is overestimating the severity. False in immediate after valvular, uh, immediate after valvular plasty, and a concave shape uh, making it difficult sometimes, and degenerative factor of mitral stenosis due to the diastolic dysfunction is uh, uh, limiting the usage of this methodology. While the mean pressure gradient has also own uh, limitation, dependent on the heart rate, dependent on cardiac output exercise, volume load due to mitral degradation, and all these methods are uh, uh, influenced by atrial fibrillation. In this case, in, in case of the patient with atrial fibrillation, we have to take several uh, the cardiac cycles and uh, get the average one. CT can be complementary um, assessment tool in uh, in order to um, evaluate the localization and extent of uh, uh, material uh, calcification in uh, in uh, annulus in order uh, in in vessels and also myocardial wall. And also, multi detector row computer tomography is uh, started to use in order to allow thorough assessment of valve morphology, quantification, and regurgitation, optimization of timing of intervention, and device selection in the procedural planning. Here, example of pre procedural multi detector computer tomography analysis using three major valve software MDCT reconstruction for pre procedural evaluation of material. Uh, valvular anatomy determine feasibility of TMR. Uh, in mitral regurgitation, we are uh, here is a well known uh, Carpentier classification modified where the type one uh, is uh, normal and the type two and three are um, due to the lifted primary lifted abnormalities, while type three B uh, is uh, belonging to the functional or secondary mitral regurgitation. And secondary material function, uh, secondary or functional material legislation is categorized type 3B. Plus, there is a material legislation due to uh, systolic anterior motion in the uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy lungs in this uh, secondary PMR. So, uh, according to the mechanism, uh, of uh, mitral regurgitation needs to be assisted well in different type of mitral regurgitation. In the rheumatic, more fibrotic fibrosis, to, uh, which is leading the effect of co are major issue. And uh, DMUR 
one motion uh, the main issue in the uh, material degradation due to prolapse it's excessive motion of the uh, the belief that in in the function of material degradation annular enlargement in geometry of left ventricle and dilatation are the more uh, the major uh, the mechanism of uh, disease the grading of severity of material degradation should be done using all these methods we go through it here, a 2D uh, and 2D color useful uh, first qualitative assessment of existence of uh, mitral regurgitation. In, uh, in T, more accurate assessment of the leaflet motion and coexisting abnormalities. And the 3D in the 3D T is accurate in diagnosing prolapse of proportion of the leaflet portion of the leaflet, also identification of the leaflet motion in degenerative material regurgitation. More advanced 3D, the random technology has started to use. With a good image acquisition, it can provide easy referring image and clear understanding of mechanisms. Comparison of three, uh, the, uh, three uh, types of uh, rendering uh, technologies used in, um, in uh, the three cases. The first row and uh, the, the, in the in the top, it is showed the segmental loculated uh, prolapse of P1 in the B lobe with P2 prolapses. In the middle row in the panel, case two showing large P2 uh, prolapses here with the different technologies and uh, with involvement of the P1 prolapse. In the bottom, uh, the, uh, the case three, which is showing P1 and P3 prolapses, shadowing and transparency improves the delineation here, a delineation in the, the scallop borders and the manic optation. Also, it is useful to uh, use the uh, 3D rendering, rendering technologies with the transparency, with the color mode, can more easily in the, the, uh, il demonstratively uh, illustrate uh, the vena contracta flow convergence uh, really in, in a good way. In regard of the qualitative uh, assessment, uh, two more uh, methods is still available, which is the flow convergence jet uh, and the jet density in a, um, uh, in a mitral world of uh, mitral regurgitation jet density in the continuous wave um, spectrum. In regard of the semi quantitative assessment, vena contracta, systolic uh, pulmonary vein flow, a most common tool. In severe material regurgitation, we see wider vena contractor and reversal flow in pulmonary vein. In this study, uh, delivers cutoff value of severity for a vena contractor in 3D in patients with the different types of material regurgitation. For moderate mitral regurgitation, 0.3 can be the cutoff value for functional mitral regurgitation, and um, almost the same for degenerative mitral regurgitation. However, for severe mitral regurgitation, cutoff value are uh, different in functional mitral regurgitation is uh, 0.52, while degenerative mitral regurgitation it is 0.62. In regard of quantitative estimation of severity of mitral degradation, PISA uh, is a useful, is a usual uh, the method for identification of error in the regurgitant volume. Error, the re effective regurgitation orifice in, in a severe mitral degradation more than 0.4 considered to be severe, and the regional uh, regurgitation volume is uh, uh, considered to be severe more than 60 milliliter. Why it is important to measure error more precisely is uh, error itself is uh, serving as a prognostic uh, value for patient uh, prognosis. So uh, those with the error more than 0.4 have a much worse prognosis in five years we can see here. In addition to all above assessment of functional mitral regurgitation, need to check a left ventricle geometry, mitral or exact area to avoid after procedural stenosis, and presence of uh, atrial septal defect, uh, PA4, and pulmonary hypertension. Uh. In assessment of mitral regurgitation, there are a number of challenges. Extentric jet, one of them, makes a difficult estimation by PISA, and a multiple jet, another concern for many, 
as it can be true multiple and also semilunar orifice with, uh, with the mitral regurgitation presentation in a commissural wave and the late systolic uh, mitral regurgitation and the distinguishing moderate to severe uh, mitral regurgitation is is a challenging situations. In conclusion, imaging assessment of mitral valve is always should be done in correlation with clinical features. Echocardiography plays the key role in diagnostic and risk stratification concerning the timing of intervention in valvular heart disease. Assessment of mitral valve apparatus requires an integrated approach involving multiple waves of transthoracic, transesophageal, 3DT, stress echo methods, and other imaging uh, tools. Quantification of severity of mitral regurgitation should be performed using qualitative, semi-quantitative, and qualitative parameters, all of them. Always assist commissure and subvolvular apparatus, annular dimension, classification. If need be, CT and KMR can be complementary. Left ventricular size, function, left arterial volume, systolic pulmonary artery pressure, TR, um, right ventricle functions are important additional parameters of mitral world, mitral regurgitation consequences. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, many thanks, uh, Dr. Mokotrime, about your excellent talk about the assessment of mitral valve disease, including the, the CT, the echo, and the and the MI. Any question from the all our speaker? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dr. for your excellent lecture, uh, covering all aspects of the uh, echo evaluation of the mitral valve disease. And uh, in case of the functional MR, because I now proceed doing the procedure for, with the mitral clip for functional MR patient, the gradient of the MR is very dynamic. It increases yeah. and decreases by the volume status or other breath pressure or other things. Then how can we inject accurately define the degree of the MR in functional MR patient? You measure it in the, uh, the if, uh, in with the full dose diuretics or in normal uh, situation with the, uh, in, uh, in real life, what would be the what would be the trait? Feature. Yes, uh, as functional uh, mitral regurgitation um, is a common uh, disorders in our practice, and uh, the assessment methodology is more or less same as uh, I went through in the uh, assessment of mitral regurgitation. We should include all uh, the qualitative, uh, semi-quantitative, and um, the uh, quantitative uh, methods, all of them. On top of that, we have to consider the, the size of left ventricle, start of left atrium. If need be, uh, MRI can be a wonderful tool to, um, to assist in decision making. That's my answer. Did I answer yeah. your question? Yeah. You, you know, the, to, the assessment of functional MR in clinically is very difficult, even for the surgeon. When we decide to do the, the, the surgical repair for the functional MR, we have to look at a lot of things, both in, including the clinical and, and the, the image and the, a lot of things. So it is very difficult. Yeah. Any other question? Agree, yes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mongo Chime. Now we have to proceed to the next topic. Our next topic will be provided by the Dr. Jawa Akazia, uh, the professor of cardiology. Currently, he's the associate director of National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease. Today, he wants to give a talk about the decision making in the management of rheumatic heart disease. Dr. Shia, please. Thank you very much. Uh, can I share my slides? None yet. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, organizers. Am I audible to all of you? Am I audible yeah. to all of you? 
yeah 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 uh, good. yes yes thank you very much uh, organizers for uh, this uh, invitation and on behalf of pakistan cardiac society i thank you all for giving me opportunity to discuss this problem because this is a third world problem i am especially touching this uh, mitral stenosis uh, which is big problem in our area because rheumatic heart disease is a problem of third world so uh, this my talk is about decision making management of rheumatic mitral stenosis mitral regurgitation whether ptmc uh, mitral valve reconstruction replacement this is a topic i am going to touch and i am very thankful to dr dega dagvia uh, for her, her nice presentation which make my task easier for uh, discussing in details the imaging uh, section of the uh, problem basically this is a big problem at least in our area in pakistan because we encounter a lot of these patients who presented in uh, uh, development age or in adult age which is affected by rheumatic mitral valve disease less likely we see other diseases like uh, 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 this uh, mitral valve prolapse and mr so we encounter these degenerative valves while discussing to our surgeons when they do lot of valvular replacement they they discuss these cases and say this is a big problem when you are dealing with the degenerated valves so to start my presentation i just have few slides regarding which we are uh, just refreshing our knowledge from our medical schools that what's going on basically normally the blood comes in left atrium and left ventricle everything is fine once this outflow is decreases in the size there are two kind of problems uh, created number one there is problem related to low cardiac output and hypocontractile or hypoplastic lv which ultimately leads to low cardiac output easy fatigability patient can have symptoms of uh, uh, the syncope and certainly the back pressure which develop in left atrium ultimately leads to uh, pulmonary venous and pulmonary artery hypertension which is uh, a cause of shortness of breath and ultimately uh, increase in left atrial pressure left atrial geometry which leads to rhythm problem particularly atrial fibrillator and atrial arrhythmia and uh, this la large la in large la is harbinger for uh, thrombus formation which is its deadly consequences later on so uh, so these are these are few major symptoms which patient can present in stage d mitral stenosis there is a severe symptomatic mitral stenosis which include include difficulty in breathing fatigue sometimes chest pain shortness of breath and uh, if it's a, a patient presented with suitable anatomy as in previous uh, section we have seen that in mitral uh, in uh, rheumatic heart disease sometimes you can't found suitable anatomy and what is suitable anatomy we are going to discuss later on in my presentation then this ptmc percutaneous transvenous mitral commissurotomy is indicated as a class 1 indication so uh, these are uh, guidelines uh, presented in september 2017 where ptmc can be considered in asymptomatic patient because uh, mitral valve intervention usually we do in symptomatic patient but certain class of patient who are asymptomatic this intervention can be considered who are those patients these include high thromboembolic risk which have a history of systemic embolism dense uh, spontaneous contrast in la and new and uh, onset of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation number one number two high risk of hemodynamic decompensation if any person uh, has need for major non cardiac surgery or desire for pregnancy so this is challenging one and sometimes we can see the stage c which is low gradient ms but that can be 
unmasked by exercise or small exercise in our uh, even at clinics. So it's a low grade in mitral stenosis, but but unfortunately it is masked when patients do exercise, then gradient increase. And again, PTMC or PMC is feasible. If, if anatomy is feasible, then patient must go for this intervention. Now, the problem in deci uh, decision making in mitral stenosis before and in pregnancy. We all know rheumatic heart disease predominantly affects mitral valve. And usually the female sex is more prone. In the area where we reside, I reside, there is a usually sometimes patients do not have any problem and they first diagnose during the first or second trimester of pregnancy. But, but uh, patient doesn't have aware of this problem. So we encounter a lot of these kind of patients in their second or third trimester where they have pregnancy, where they have atrial fibrillation. Now the problem with anticoagulation and whether you go for this procedure because radiations, we all know that PTMC is not without radiation. And in cath lab, there are a lot of radiation. So usually we avoid doing this procedure in first and in second trimester. But yes, we do a lot of these procedures in third trimester. And this is a case series which we have published in 2009, 30-30 pregnant patient with critical mitral stenosis uh, uh, in their third trimester. And uh, I, I must say it's very challenging because uh, a patient, how patient can lie, then you have to cover her with uh, all lead aprons and you try to minimize fluoro time and uh, we all know that uh, viscera are not at same position once you're, they are being pushed by this uterus. So puncture is again challenging in these kind of cases. But we see these kind of patients a lot of time. Another difficult situation when mitral stenosis and coronary artery disease coexist. So as you, we all are aware that any patient who is going for this procedure after 40 years of age, then they must undergo coronary angiogram. And we found not very infrequently patients who has coronary artery disease simultaneously with mitral stenosis. And first case we did uh, in 2008 uh, and published that uh, PTNC and angioplasty at same uh, setting, though there is a lot of room for discussion here that when to give a print, which procedure should we do first. So, but uh, fortunately, this was successful case and few cases we also did afterwards. But uh, still, there is a thought or some people uh, usually uh, criticize it. They don't do it simultaneously. But we all know that uh, we all learn from our practices. So it's a debatable topic. Now, what in real life replace the damage gate? So if we... If we just so what is the rule of thumb, anything which is damaged, you have to replace it. But repair or replace, then it's very difficult because we know that replacement has certain its own problems and uh, repair has again some problems. So surgical option two, one, two, three, there is mechanical valve implantation, bioprosthetic valve implantation, or mitral commissurotomy, but it's obsolete in these days because of this percutaneous procedure. But we, we still following these patients well, 15, 20 years back, they had mitral commissurotomy. They are doing well. They are doing well. Again, there are different type of mitral commissurotomy, open and close. They have their own details. So this picture will uh, is showing what options this uh, uh, the presentation of same, which I have discussed in previous slide, it, what options we do have and where we should go with which modality. Our decision making is important. You have to sit with the patient and uh, say what's best for her or what is for him. So uh, putting a mechanical valve is uh, durable. It has very long, uh, long life. 
We are seeing patient, falling patient who has 20, 30 years, they are doing well, then good relief of symptoms, good opening of mitral valve, that basically has also with a, a tissue valve as well, but problem is lifelong anticoagulation and regular INR testing, it's a major surgical procedure. This slide looks very simple, but you can talk minutes and hours on this because this is very tricky, very complex, very challengeable uh, situation. You can see because you are dealing a drug which is a very narrow therapeutic index. Number one, one challenge. Number two challenge, this drug is notorious for drug interaction for a number of drugs. Not only drugs, but number of food items as well. And uh, unfortunately, you're dealing with the uh, population who is not very educated in this area. Uh, it's written two to three INR, some people, but uh, guidelines 2.5 to 3.5 upper limit in mitral area. But it's, it's really challenging practically if, uh, if my colleague has experience of running a supervising INR clinic, which I do have in my hospital. So it's very challenging. Uh, we are praying that uh, there is no X, no X, whatever is new drugs, have some indication these kind of, still not, but uh, I'm hoping that uh, uh, if some uh, indication emerge, then life become easier. But still we are going with warfarin. This uh, bioprosthetic valve, definitely good relief of symptom. The problem with bioprosthetic is it has uh, uh, redo surgery is required after 10 to 11 years. But good thing, the patient can complete her family if it is a reproductive age. No anticoagulation is required, but problem is they, uh, they regenerate within 10 years, 10 to 15 years. Now, decision making in mitral commissurotomy. It centers with high level of expertise, may have better long term outcome uh, who are going and uh, undergoing PTMC, and, but there is a risk of embolic events. If you, uh, if my, as my colleague said, if you have properly uh, non-invasively tested, then these risks can reach up to less than 2% or less than up to zero. But it's again an invasive procedure. And in my center with, where I work, we usually do these kind of procedures around four to 500 years procedures per year. So, uh, this is New England Journal of Medicine and uh, Circulation. They both have show, uh, uh, studies have shown that randomized trial. Uh, randomized trial uh, have shown established the safety and efficacy of PTMC as compared with the surgical close and open commissurot mean patient with favorable uh, valve morphology less than 2 plus MR in absence of LA thrombus. So this is really an effective procedure. Uh, these are recommendations at multidisciplinary and heart valve team and heart valve center. Uh, the patient with severe uh, valvular heart disease should be evaluated by multidisciplinary heart valve team when intervention is considered. And cons consultation with or referral of primary comprehensive heart valve center is reasonable when treatment options are being discussed asymptomatic patient, patient who have benefit from well repair versus replacement, and patient with multiple comorbidities. Now, again, in real life, we replace the damage gate, at, uh, we have discussed earlier, but repair is also a cost effective and time buying option uh, if we want a palliation to the patient. Uh, this is a busy slide where we can see the Wilkin score. There are Four components of mitral valve are being considered in this. That is mobility, thickening, calcification, and uh, subvalvular apparatus. So four is the minimum number. 16 is the highest number. And uh, where we think that PTNC can be effective and uh, complication three when uh, this Wilkin score is eight or less. So long-term follow-up 
studies are, are available in literature which have shown 70 to 80 percent of patients with initial good results after PTMC to be free of recurrent symptoms at 10 years and 30 to 40 percent are free of recurrent symptoms at 20 years. These are the few images, the options available we have. Uh, you all are familiar with uh, these two, definitely. This is NOA, this is double balloon, there's a Bonhoeffer technique. And this third one is metallic valve, which I've seen in my resident time. This, uh, uh, this thing is being used in uh, low-income countries because it's a reusable, it's a Caribbean metallic valve, but there are a lot of problem with uh, this uh, device. So again, in this procedure challenge is a septal puncture, which uh, sometimes is very difficult. And uh, you can go into the aorta, you can go into the pericardium, and there are a lot of issues, but with uh, good practice or uh, backup, surgical backup, things are quite under control. So these are uh, multiple techniques. Sometimes you have to do, go with reverse loop or normally, you know, uh, we exclusively 90, 95% use this in well, and sometimes this bone of urban, we stuck and uh, uh, this procedure is not successful. This is, these are few pictures. We are uh, relating to the geometry of mitral well. People, a few people uh, are really convinced to, uh, opening this well with double balloon is more effective than in a way. Then there are certain contraindication to PTMC when valve area is more than 1.5 and uh, when uh, there is a LA thrombus in more than 2 plus mitral regurgitation, severe biocommissural calcification, that's the Wilkin score is more than absence of commissural fusion and severe concomitant aortic valve or severe combined tricuspid uh, valve disease or concomitant coronary artery disease requiring bypass surgery. So this is a flow chart, a flow chart. This is a flow chart where we can see that any severe mitral stenosis area less than one and their, their geometry is, so, sorry, anatomy is supporting to mitral will then go uh, uh, PTMC. And if there is a problem of highest, high Wilkin score, uh, then you have to go or you have to opt other treatment options. In management, management of clinical significant mitral uh, stenosis, uh, if there is no symptom in high risk of thromboembolism, exercise testing, if uh, uh, there is no contraindication, then go for PTMC. And if there is a contraindication or unfavorable characteristic, then PTMC uh, surgery uh, is another option. So, uh, the, after looking at all of the data, what I think its conclusion of my presentation is symptom, including functional class, has crucial importance in decision making in management of mitral valve disease and other modalities, including, including non invasive imaging, complement our decision. And this is a picture where I work, this is the biggest center in the Pakistan. And uh, I take opportunity to uh, say something about my institution. This is where we are working at world's largest primary PCI center. This network of hospital is 10 hospitals in different areas of our province. This is the biggest and other nine hospitals. And uh, we did uh, approximately 9,000 primary angioplasties in one year uh, before COVID. Uh, in our these centers and with this again i thank you all for your patience listening and inviting me inviting pakistan in this uh, uh, meeting thank you very much thank you professor sears for your excellent talk about the management of rheumatic heart disease especially the ptmc you do have a lot of experience of, of ptmc in your country any questions from the from all the speaker? Yeah, Dr. Shu, just want to ask Dr. Shall we also do PTMC in the Philippines? I'm Dr. Mm -hmm. Estacio. I'm from the Philippines. 
Um, do you go as high as a valve score 9 or a 10 uh, doing, or what is your cutoff valve score when you do PTMC? Uh, valve score, basically what yeah. we follow, we follow uh, the two different uh, area. Number one, height of the patient in uh, this inner balloon. There's a, a data that uh, height of person in uh, in centimeters divided by yeah. ten plus ten. That's 10 a simple plus rule 10. we follow and for the for the scoring system. Yeah? For the scoring, the scoring system, system for the valve. Ah, for the scoring system for the valve and uh, the rough area. We want to increase the valve area up to 100%. Say, for example, we are dealing a patient whose area is uh, 0.8, and we will be more than happy if her or his area after procedure come 1.6 or 1.7. Okay. Uh, just to share, um, we do not as many as Dr. Shal, but uh, I think three or four PTMCs a week. Uh, we normally don't get we're happy if we get a mitral valve score of eight, seven or eight. So everybody's going to be happy. But most of the time we get, uh, it's a socioeconomic problem, rheumatic uh, mitral stenosis, valve score nine. So what we do is just as long as the subvalvar is not severe and uh, the, the calcification is evenly distributed, then we, we normally push for the PTMC. And uh, if it's a high valve score, as we call it, we normally target 1.5. If you get about 1.5 and above, then you stop. Some operators, if you don't still have the MR, even if it's mild, they still push it. So sometimes it's a problem. And for the other, may I just share for, um, for PTMC and coronary artery disease? Fortunately, we have not seen these patients, but normally I think what you should do if your coronaries are amenable to PTMC, what we normally do is do the transeptal puncture first because after the transeptal puncture, that's when you go, you're going to give your heparin. Then leave the coiled wire inside the LA, proceed with your PCI. After your PCI, then proceed with your PTMC. Uh, sure. Pregnancy. <laughs> pregnancy. Uh, we try to not do it at the first trimester. I agree with Dr. Shal. It's a terrible problem because you take, you're take, um, looking after the mother and the child. So if after 26, 28 weeks, you're still in functional three, then we bring this patient to the cath lab and we do a PTMC. If we can get a moderate uh, mitral stenosis, maybe a 1.3, 1.4, not up for a perfect valve score which can just tide over the mother for delivery then we we stop the procedure we only have about 10 when i was a fellow that was ages ago 10 series of pregnant persons we had mm. just one mortality we had a severe mr uh, which we were not able to save both unfortunate but we do normally ptmc for the second third trimester but if this patient will benefit with medication, I guess you should push for medication until delivery, just assisted second stage and do the PTMC after the baby is out. Yeah, just my thought. Thank you. Great. Any other question? Uh, I, I'll reserve my, my rheumatic question for Dr. Kang because he's doing mitral clip. I won't preempt you. I'll ask one question later on. <laughs> okay, okay. So we have to finish this this topic and uh, proceed to the next one. The next one will be provided by the professor Kang from Korea. Uh, he currently he is the assistant professor of interventional cardiology at the Ensign Medical Center. Today he wants to give a, a talk about the severe functional or non-rheumatic mitral regurgitation in patients with reduced in rejection pressure. Professor Ken, please. Yeah, thank you for your introduction, Dr. Su. Uh, I'm Dr. Kang from Asa Medical Center, and I am an interventional cardiologist. So there can be some bias because I'm uh, mitral clip operator. 
And my topic is about the decision making management of severe non rheumatic mitral regurgitation with half rep. So there can be two situations one, degenerative MR in half rep, two, secondary MR related to the reduced ejection fraction. And in the uh, situation, which would be the recommended uh, treatment for the patient, and mitral clip, and be repair or replacement. Uh, because the mitral, because in situation surgery is uh, of long standing standard of the treatment, and mitral clip is a challenger. So I will talk about the, on the point of the mitral clip. I have nothing to disclose. And mitral, mitral regurgitation, as previously uh, we discussed, it means inappropriate closure of mitral valve and causing backward leaking of the blood. And it's the second most frequent indication for valve surgery. And it can be occur from an abnormality of the disease or process, process that affect any one of the functional components of the apparatus. And there are two types of the mitral regurgitation, first degenerative MR primary, and second functional MR secondary. And because of the big success of the TAVA for aortic stenosis, many doctors and the companies are anticipating the success of the mitral valve procedure, but it is different in the mitral valve because there are very high variability and instability of the anatomy and apparatus is very complex and access is difficult than aortic valve. And there are two different pathologies, primary and secondary MR. And now I will talk about the mitral clip, which is so-called transcatheter H2H repair, tear. The tear is a mimicking procedure of the r surgical repair that make a stitch on the, the A2P2 to reduce the mitral valve regurgitation. And this is concept of tear with mitral clip, go into the IVC, RA, and septal puncture into LA, and then clip the regurgitated uh, mitral valve, and then the procedure finishes. This is a very simple concept video that make you to understand easily about the mitral clip procedure. Septal puncture from RA into LA, and introduce the sheets, and then insert the clip into LA and then make some movement to head to the regurgitant mitral valve and go into the LV with the appropriate angle, then catch the leaflet like the RFA repair. And then the procedure is finished. This is the concept of the mitral clip procedure. As you can see, this is transcatheter H2H repair procedure. It's inherent the limitation of the, the H2H repair system. Uh, it can be, the result can be less appropriate than surgery. As you can see in the right panel, surgery do the, when do the mitral valve repair, they, Surgeon can do the annular plasty with the annular plasty limb and repair the damaged leaflet very consciously, and then result would be perfect. So metal clip with the uh, with the inferior result compared with the surgery was uh, was tested in the highest surgical patient. Then let's check the evidence and guidance recommendations for mitral clip. There are two types of the MR, so guideline and evidence are separated to primary and secondary MR. Let's check the primary MR recommendation first. There was one RCT, Everest 2 RCT, that compared mitral clip versus surgery in randomized trial two by one. And the age was about seven, uh, 66 in, and male was 6%. And as you can see in the uh, table, the primary efficacy endpoint, freedom from death or surgery or grade three or four plus MR was much better, uh, was low, uh, much, much better in surgery patient 
compared with the repair. And, and mainly the difference was from the resurgery or resurgery uh, for the mitral valve dysfunction. As you can see, the safety, in the safety, the device group, the mitral clip showed lower uh, safety endpoint because it's a very simple and safe procedure. And clinical success rate was uh, worse than surgery, but acceptable rate. So in the, as you can see in the uh, graph, the freedom from mortality was similar between groups, but freedom from mitral valve surgery and reoperation was worse in the mitral click group. And in 76 highly patient suburban analysis, freedom from mortality was better in high risk mitral click group when compared with the concurrent comparative group. So with this result of the worse clinical outcome, but similar safety endpoint, the transcatheter mitral valve repair was recommended in degenerative MR patient with a prohibited surgical risk in 2014. And with the use of the mitral clip for the prohibited or very high surgical risk patient, its use increased. And in 2017, about 3,000 patients in US, the result from the STS registry was reported. The median age was 82 and STS risk score of the mortality for repair was 6% and 9% for replacement. And degenerative MR was 86%. And in-hospital mortality was very low com when considering the highest feature of the patient, it was only 2.7%. And that's an hospitalization rate was acceptable. So in 2020 AH guideline, the treatment of the primary MR recommends the uh, recommends that the in symptomatic patients with severe MR, the mitral valve intervention recommended irrespective of every systolic function. And in asymptomatic patients with severe primary MR and every systolic dysfunction, mitral valve surgery is recommended by 1B recommendation. And in patients with severe primary MR for surgery, mitral valve repair is recommended in preference of mitral valve replacement because the outcomes of the repair is well established in long-term history. And when the mitral clip is indicated, it's only indicated in the primary CBM MR and high or prohibited surgical risk. And in the situation, the mitral clip is reasonable at 2A indication. And in, there's another uh, recommendation in the US guideline, then in symptomatic or asymptomatic patient with a severe primary MR and LVD systolic dysfunction, GDM, and in patient whose surgery is not possible, GDM for systolic dysfunction is reasonable. So this is current guideline. In patient with primary MR and mitral valve surgery is indicated in patient with severe LVD systolic dysfunction, but only in patients with high or prohibited surgical risk patient, mitral clip is reasonable. And in patient undergo surgery, mitral valve repair is re uh, recommended as a first, uh, first recommendation for degenerative MV disease. And there are major guideline changes from the prohibited surgical risk to, to a high or prohibited surgical risk. And to be recommendation, to a recommendation for mitral clip, but you must remember there are unchanged indication for mitral clip for primary MR. There is only severely symptomatic patient and favorable mitral valve anatomy and life expectancy more than one year and high or prohibited surgical risk. This is the anatomic feasibility of mitral clip. And in patient with the unsuitable mitral valve, then mitral clip is not a good treatment choice. So there will be a scenario one for primary MR with inpatient with half ref. Surgery is treatment of choice and MV repair is usually recommended. In high surgical risk patients without need of other cardiac surgery like KBG or other valve procedure, mitral valve, mitral click is reasonable. So heart team discussion is essential. This is the, our case 
83-year-old male patient primary MR as a history of a persistent AFib hypertension in angina and mildly decreased the LBC historic function and severe eccentric MR. And because the patient is very old, 83-year-old, and there is diffusion of sclerosis and heart in discussion considering old age as the score of mortality high and a high risk of stroke. So we decided to perform the multi procedure. And with a simple procedure of the two hours with just femoral pain puncture, the patient was treated and now doing well over two e one year now. And now let's talk about the secondary MR. This is the main topic for mitral clip for half rep. So there was no recommendation in 2017 about the secondary MR valve guideline for transcatheter and bleed repair. And after then, there was two randomized trials in 2018. One is the mitral trial in France that randomized 300 patients to mitral clip versus medical treatment for the functional MR patient. And the result shows that no difference between mitral clip versus medical treatment. Everyone was disappointed at this moment. And another trial from US with a large size, 600 patient, a COEP trial was published in 2080. And it also randomized mitral clip versus OMT by one by one. And the key, inclu in key inclusion criteria was more strict than mitral effort trial. Ejection fraction 20 to 50 percent, every end history diameter equal or less than 17 millimeter, and severe or moderate to severe MR by US ASC criteria more strict, and we have functional class two to four despite a stable maximally tolerated GDMT, including CRT. Over two, 20 percent patient receive CRT, and the patient with the Established from a hypertension patient was excluded. And this is the primary effectiveness endpoint of the oral hospitalization for heart failure for 24 months and much better in mitral clip compared with the medical treatment. And all cause mortality was about, showed about 40% reduction in mitral clip patient. And number needed to treat to prevent one death was just five a very excellent result to prevent death. And in the extended follow-up in three years, the difference was maintained in mitral clip. And the safety endpoint, the freedom from adverse event was very low, at the very high in mitral clip patient. And all device related, related complication rate was very low. So MR severity, three or four plus, in orange or red color is well decreased after mitral clip and well maintained over three years. So this is comparison between COEP and mitral FL trial that did not and did show the benefit of mitral clip in functional MR patient. What would be the difference? And some uh, very thorough analysis showed that mitral clip patient did not show benefit in patients with greater AV enlargement and less, less severe MR in mitral FR patient. That means if the patient has the long standing MR, so AV enlargement and AV systolic failure progress, then at that moment, the role of mitral clip is not so big. And in COEP trial, the patient AV volume was relatively small, and the degree of the regurgitation was very high. In this kind of the disproportionately very severe MR patient was benefited with the mitral clip procedure. So this is another conceptual framework from the previous old trials that showed mitral valve surgery or mitral clip or CRT showed beneficial. The, the patient uh, indication was in the patient with the smaller LV, diameter, LV volume with higher degree of the regurgitation. In trials that did not show the bene benefit from the surgery CRT mitral clip was targeted the patient with the 
relatively larger LV volume and smaller degree of the metal regurgitation. So targeting this kind of the population would be very important for successful metal clip procedure for functional MR patient with reduced LV ejection fraction. So in 2010, US guideline was updated with a new recommendation of mitral clip for a coem like patient that this is the, the sentence of the recommendation. In patient with a chronic severely secondary MR related to the LV systolic dysfunction, if the patient is persistent symptomatic despite on the optimal medical therapy, a mitral clip would be reasonable for appropriate anatomy and LV ejection fraction between 20 and 50 and LV and the systolic diameter equal or less than 70 millimeter and primary artery high systolic pressure equal or less than 70 millimeter mercury as two A recommendation. And how about the surgery for functional MR? There can be some techniques, a downsized manual plastic repair or valve replacement with codal sparing. And surgery, actually surgery has not been shown to improve long-term survival for functional MR patients because there was no large size trial yet. But the advantage of the surgery is that they, it can be done with the other procedures like cabbage or LA appendage amputation in AP patient or other valve surgery. There was some RCTs for functional MR patient one is CTSN RCT1 that compared MV repair versus repairs, replacement in patients with severe ischemic MR. And 75% patients received concomitant cabbage and 12% mage and mean CPV time was uh, for 144 minutes. They showed MV repair and replacement showed similar death rate at 24 months and major adverse cardiac event was similar between groups. However, the degree of the moderate to severe remnant MR and heart failure and CVD admission rate was higher in repair group compared with the replacement. Second RCT is cabbage versus cabbage plus MV repair for moderate ischemic MR patient. 300 patients was randomized and moderate to severe residual MR was remain, remained more in the cabbage group. But the death rate and major adverse cardiac or cerebral vascular event was similar between metal valve repair plus cabbage and cabbage alone group. So metal valve repair in addition to cabbage did not, could not, uh, could not uh, approve, could not prove it's lower in ischemic MR. So there are policy of data showing benefit of surgery over medical therapy in functional MR, and there is no robust head-to-head -head comparison of surgery versus CLIM yet. And there are many ongoing mitral CLIM or other TKM VR trials, but they are focused largely on functional MR. So I've, my concern is that surgery for functional MR is rapidly being superseded by cut therapy like mitral CLIM. So its true effectiveness can likely not to be known. So this is the current recommendation for secondary MR with half rep in patient with the COEP trial criteria and 2A recommendation, mitral clip is recommended. And if the patient need cabbage and mitral valve surgery is reasonable as 2A recommendation. And in patient with atrial annular dilation, with the AP or other region, then mitral valve surgery may be considered. And the patient with the LV systolic dysfunction and secondary MR, and still persistent to severely symptomatic, surgery may be considered, but this is to be recommendation. And in patient with the coronary disease and chronic severely secondary MR, and caudal sparing mitral valve replacement may be reasonable to choose over the downside annular plus repair on the basis of the CTSN-1 trial. So this is the current flow chart of the decision-making. GDMT first, this is the class one recommendation. And still symptomatic patient that ejection fraction less than 50 and anatomy favorable and meet this criteria, then mitral clip can be done. 
And in other case, when need cabbage, surgery is recommended. And other case, surgery can be considered as to be indication. And all for the, this kind of functional patient, standard GDM and cardiology expert in the manager of the heart failure is number one recommendation. So this is an updated recommendation for secondary MR. And we have now, we have another strong weapon for heart failure patient on my track clip. Heart failure specialist provides optimal GDMT before and after my track clip is the most important. So there can be scenario two, secondary MR in patient with heart rate. If the patient meets core criteria, my track clip is recommended as 2A. In patient who need cabbage, surgery is reasonable as 2A. And in patient, if the patient undergoes surgery, Codal sparing mitral valve replacement may be reasonable to choose over downsized annual plus repair. And most of all, guideline directed medical therapy should be maximized. So, this is my last case. The 73 year old female patient with DCM 29% ejection fraction, long standing MR, and severe functional MR intractable to this dyspnea uh, despite of the maximal medical treatment. Severe cardiomegaly and dilated LV. And TEE also showed eccentric functional MR and with moderate from hypertension. So this kind of patient, uh, we must check the anatomy and the anatomy was feasible. And the patient was here of disproportionately treated very severe MR uh, compared with the size of the LV. And my tracheal procedure was done in two hours. And the result was great. And the mitral clip was done in two hours, a minimally invasive, and discharged in three days. And two months after mitral clip, the patient symptom improved and cardiomegaly improved. And we could maximize the medication because the blood pressure increased. And TT after two months showed decreased LV cavity size with improved LV history function and improved IV contractility and pulmonary hypertension disappeared. Yeah. yeah, this is comparison before and after procedure. And then how to maximize the mitral clip success in FMR. Maximal GDMT is important and uh, selecting the good candidate is very important. And heart team is very important. So this is summary. 2020 updated mitral clip is stable anatomy and primary MR high or prohibited surgical risk. Secondary MR persistent after GDMT and meet this criteria. And also in Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology made a consensus recommendation for use of the mitral clip for MR. And it was, it was published this year, and maybe you can make a reference to the patient. This is summary. Mitral clip is a reasonable alternative for significant MR patients with high surgical risk. For primary MR with half ref, mitral valve repair surgery is preferred. Mitral clip is recommended in high or prohibited surgical risk patients. For secondary MR with half ref, mitral clip is recommended for persistent symptomatic MR patients even after GADMT. And appropriate decision making by heart team is important. Thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Professor Ken, about your excellent talk in management of functional MR in patients with reduced ejection fraction. Any questions from the other speaker? Uh, Dr. Kang, in real world, how many clips do you normally put inside the patient? Uh, when you do your uh, mitral clip procedure? Uh, in our center, the average value of the clip was 1.7. And okay. uh, that means in many, many patients receive one or two. And usually in functional MR, we needed two because the valve area is larger and the regurgitant area is larger. And in cases with uh, the degenerative MR, one is uh, more prevalent and with a G4 system that has the larger size of the clip and the number of the clip is decreasing. Is this a 
just to ask the because this is a very prohibitive uh, device in our place uh, how do you how does the patient uh, pay for the for the clips does the company give uh, one clip and if you need two they don't charge the the second clip uh, how does it work in korea yeah there's a problem because we just started the metal clip last year and just one and a half year passed and it is not covered by the health insurance health insurance system okay. yet. So 100% paid by the patient and that's the largest hurdle for the metal clip procedure. Okay, yeah. that's the same. How much, um, how much it costs? Very, <laughs> very expensive. Very expensive. Yeah, about uh, 30, Thirty thousand, yeah, US, uh, US yes. dollar. Very here, so. it's about uh, we spent about four million pesos divided by fifty-five. That's the exchange rate US <laughs> to Philippine pesos. So yeah. that's expensive. That's yeah. why it's actually very we yeah, actually we talk much about the guidelines and the evidences. Mm. But number one decision priority is the the, the price. Right. <laughs> <Now. laughs> Being able to pay. Yeah, yeah. I think. And when, yeah, when you decide that second uh, device is being put in or repaired during procedure? Oh, uh, so if the metal clip, first metal clip could not catch all the legal content areas and we plan to implant second clip. And usually we plan before the procedure with the T images, one or two clips and the consideration to add one or not is that the mitral valve area, remnant mitral valve area of the first clip or pressure gradient. If the pres pressure gradient rises over five or mitral valve area decreases, then uh, the second clip uh, would be avoided. If you have like moderate mitral stenosis or uh, mild yeah. mitral stenosis, then you have to stop. Yeah. Mild, mild MSC would be okay, but moderate severe is not, <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> because of the, uh, the time limit limitation, so we have to proceed to the next two topic. The next two topic will be chaired by the Professor Gong. Professor Gong, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next topic is uh, talked by the, told by the, the Dr. Ronaldo Estacio from the Philippine Heart Center. He is the invasive cardiologist, and his topic is the decision making in management of the new onset mitral regurgitation complicated in acute STEMI or non STEMI, PCI, cabbage, mitral repair, or hybrid. Very difficult topic, very, yes, in very, very hard situation. <laughs> I, uh, I hope I can your give talk. justice. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll Great. share my slides. Oh, for well. I can't for I'll just play my slides. Um, seems that uh, sorry, but I'm having problems. I'll stop share first, and then I'll share again. Okay. Give me a few seconds. I'll just call somebody to help me here. Okay, then then shall we oh no. Yes. Then shall we change the exchange the oh, is it oh he's coming back? Yeah. Okay. Share slides. Okay. Okay. Um. <laughs>
Okay, let's. Okay, sorry for that. Um, my talk for today is thank you again for inviting me, but my talk is really difficult because I cannot really find any any guidelines or any journal to to um, make the discussion, but I'll try my best with some of the uh, just some of the small articles that I've seen. Decision making in acute myocardial infarction uh, in ACS and revascularization. Uh, first is uh, mitral regurgitation, as uh, we have known, has been primary or secondary. Uh, for primary, you have uh, problems with your mitral valve apparatus, and for secondary, it's more the dilatation of your uh, mitral valve annulus. And uh, disease progression in natural history, uh, you have heard that severe MR untreated has fairly poor prognosis, irrespective of the etiology. You will have worse quality of life, heart failure symptoms, and atrial fibrillation. So uh, with mitral clip here and uh, GDMT, hopefully you can alleviate some of these factors. Um, therapy for severe uh, acute onset mitral regurgitation is always uh, surgery. Uh, but I will discuss some instances where in post-PCI, post post-TEMI, and post-ACS, you will have some mild or moderate mitral regurgitation and uh, what you should do with this. But for, for severe uh, mitral regurgitation occurring during uh, ACS and this patient goes into shock, definitely the treatment would be revascularization with mitral valve uh, surgery. So this is just a, what they call atrial functional MR, wherein you have an isolated atrial fibrillation, the presence of normal leaflet. Okay, secondary MR, you should uh, treat them with uh, heart failure regimen, cardiac resynchronization therapy, if you have coronary artery disease, treat the CAD. Um, class 2B surgery for grade 3 or 4 secondary MR despite OMT. And in general, neither mitral valve replacement or repair has been shown to improve survival in treatment of severe functional MR. So for ischemic myocardial regurgitation, it's a common occurrence following myocardial infarction, and its presence is associated with poor outcome. If you have a ischemic myocardial infarction and the MR is mild, then treat the CAD and observe. Uh, they have found out that uh, normally you have to follow up these patients who have coronary artery disease with trivial or mild MR. Treat the CAD first with either PCI and cabbage and monitor this patient's MR because in the, in the long run, they have a pro propensity to progress because of, they've said, uh, LV remodeling or progression of your ischemia. Uh, for coronary artery disease with severe MR and a dilated annulus, as I've stated, you can treat it with cabbage and repair or replacement of the mitral valve. The problem is when it comes to moderate MR. So this is a gray zone where um, there is a lot of debate whether to touch or not to touch moderate MR. So ischemic myocardial infarction following M uh, acute myocardial infarction. IMR, uh, it has been shown that mechanical, rep if you develop AMI or acute myocardial infarction with the presence of MR, whether mild, moderate, maybe severe, the mechanical reperfusion either PCI or cabbage of the infarct-related artery is superior to fibrinolysis or medical management alone. Uh, this is because when you do your PCI or even revascularization patient with AMI, you recruit most of the hibernating myocardium. And if you have an MR secondary to an ACS, recruiting the myocardium prevents or increases the contraction of your myocardium it shortens out or improves the papillary muscle function and sometimes it improves your MR. The only problem with AMI is that when AMI is accompanied with MR and on 2D echo, you have papillary muscle rupture. And usually in patients with papillary muscle rupture secondary to acute myocardial infarction, these are patients that goes into cardiogenic shock. So if this happens, then I think the 
primary treatment would be putting in your support devices, uh, lowering down your afterload with medication, and calling in your friendly neighborhood surgeon to do uh, to do your uh, cabbage and mitral valve repair. As we have said in this era of PCI, early revascularization in patients with AMI is a key improving survival. MR following AMI, MR is an independent predictor of long-term cardiovascular mortality. Uh, risk factors for having MR or uh, the progression of MR would be advanced age, prior MR, infarct extension, and recurrent ischemia. Uh, remember that if you are not able to open the infarct-related artery, there's still some ischemia ongoing. And in the future, a moderate or a mild or moderate MR can become severe secondary to left ventricular remodeling. And this is where your problem or your heart failure would start. During acute myocardial infarction, there is an early phase MR, uh, wherein there is a transient ischemic MR, which is common secondary to recurrent ischemia. So if you treat the infarct-related artery, normally the ischemic MR disappears and there is no hemodynamic compromise. But when several corda tendine or papillary muscle ruptures, then it's a, this is where your patients will de develop acute cardiogenic shock. And this is where you have to call your surgeons to do cabbage for the, info, for the coronary artery, as well as mitral valve repair. And usually in patients who does not develop any hemodynamic compromise, um, and has mild or moderate MR, usually they just treat the culprit artery or the infarct-related artery, and they just monitor these patients uh, in the long run because sometimes these patients undergo remodeling and uh, they may, the MR may progress from moderate to severe. So mild functional ischemic MR following uh, AMI, uh, in one study, it's just 94 patients. Uh, group one had mild MR. These are diabetic patients, elderly, smoker, hypertensive. They have more STEMI than NSTEMI. Uh, and group two has no MR. They found out if you only have mild MR, there's no difference in in-hospital mortality and cardiovascular outcomes. And no revascularization for the mitral valve is, is uh, needed. Uh, IMR in ACS STEMI and STEMI, there's one prospective uh, single center study, and they have found out even after primary PCI, uh, they have found that at discharge, there was ischemic MR was found in 42%. And LV remodeling in six months when they follow up this patient is 25%. And predictor of left ventricular remodeling in six months was ischemic MR severity. So if you have severe MR and a low EF, then these patients normally go into, um, into heart failure. So the highest incidence of ischemic MR in patients with, is seen in inferior wall rather than the anterior wall MI. This is because of the position of the papillary muscles. So in this study, they had an inferior, they, they collected patients who developed AMI with inferior and anterior wall. Uh, less global remodeling and dysfunction, but greater ischemic MR incidence in patients with inferior wall MI. This is because of the effect of the right coronary in, your, in the position of your papillary muscle. The ejection fraction was preserved in inferior wall uh, compared to the anterior wall. Um, the MR incidence jet was about 38% if you have an inferior wall and 10% if you just have an anterior wall. This is because of the uh, posterior papillary muscle tethering distance greater in inferior wall. So the greater geometric changes in the mitral valve apparatus with greater displacement of the papillary muscle caused by localized inferior basal remodeling. So it's still important that if you have an inferior wall MI is to get this patient early during the golden period and reperfuse the carpet artery just to prevent uh, ischemic myocardial regurgitation. Okay, the course of ischemic MR in AMI after primary PCI, still primary PCI can provide dynamic improvement of LV function, which should dramatically affect the magnitude of IMR because this improves the uh, myocardial function 
prevents dilatation of your LV and tethering of your papillary muscles. So it brings your mitral valve apparatus together, coptates, and reduces the MR. The acute effects of primary PCI on IMR and its relation to degrees of LV parameters, meaning the lesser the the higher the left ventricular function and the, the smaller the LV uh, during the, uh, the during the acute PCI, the lesser would be your ischemic myocardial infarct uh, regurgitation. However, if during primary PCI you already have a very bad LV. Uh, sometimes this patient during the chronic phase can remodel and cause uh, severity of your MR. Okay. Predictive factors for phasic changes in acute IMR. Uh, you should be able to get this patient early, the shortest onset of to reperfusion time or door to wiring time should be less than 90 minutes if feasible. And then when you go to the cath lab, your TIMI flow should be, they say it's more than TIMI 1, but Dr. Kang would disagree with us. You have to get a TIMI 3 flow uh, to improve uh, recruitment of your uh, ischemic myocardium, and this will improve your IMR. High, but higher age, lower EF at acute phase and higher peak CKNB were independent predictors of persistent uh, more than mild MR at six to eight months. So if you have a low EF, uh, heart failure symptoms, in, uh, higher CKMB. These are patients with ischemic MR post PCI that you have to monitor because they remodel and they become the MR becomes more severe after the uh, acute phase. Okay. Um, the course of ischemic MR in AMI, uh, IMR was seen in thirty six percent at patients. Uh, presenting at the ER, majority would be mild in the patient in the paper of Nishino. Moderate would be 24 and 10% would just be severe. And they have found out that uh, when they do a PCI in acute myocardial infarction, usually the mild and moderate MRs uh, usually downgrades to either disappearing or the moderate would be mild. So it's still um, a good practice to open up the culprit artery. But there are some patients whose MR still persists to become severe. And these are problematic patients because they have a 30 day worse outcome. So I think these are patients after PCI of the culprit artery, which has severe uh, MR, has to be placed on a heart team approach as what to do with your mitral valve. And if the question is post PCI, how do I stop my anticoagulation treatment? But uh, now there are stents available that you can stop it within a month and go for other surgery. So long-term prognostic value for MR. Um, MR grade was inversely related to EF and directly related to the BNP level. So if you get a patient with ACS, low EF, high BNP, then these are patients who have very poor long-term outcome. Older patients, history of MI, congestive heart failure, and previous angina are also prognosticators for long-term uh, poor outcome. So treatment strategies for acute coronary syndrome with severe regurgitation and their effects on short and long-term prognosis. Uh, I think mitral regurgitation of even mild severity affects the prognosis of patients with acute coronary syndrome. So if you have severe MR and ACS, cabbage plus MVR in the acute phase is the treatment and not PCI alone. But if you have a moderate or mild MR during ACS, I think opening up the culprit artery or either opening up the culprit and non-culprit artery will improve your ischemic mitral regurgitation. So the effect of revascularization strategy on the severity of ischemic moderate MR is still in question. So it's either you do PCI alone or cabbage. So the idea is LB dysfunction resulting for hibernating but recoverable myocardium has been um, the option of treatment when revascularization is improved. So you have to recruit as many as recoverable myocardium as possible 
when you treat patients with ischemic, acute ischemic MR. And with this, you improve myocardial perfusion. And you usually reverse the dilatation or remodeling of this patient. So IMR and cabbage and IMR post cabbage. Uh, the impact of moderate ischemic MR is really a debate. Um, ischemic MR before cabbage or I after isolated cabbage increases the incidence of cardiac related deaths and all deaths in patients, especially with low EEF. Um, ischemic MR affects survival in five years in patients with very low ejection fraction. So there are two groups and there are two debates, uh, two, uh, two schools of thought. The best clinical data available today supports that isolated cabbage with moderate MR is the treatment of choice rather than cabbage and mitral valve replacement. I see Dr. Shu smiling. Maybe he can react later on. But they, in some papers, they've said that if you do isolated cabbage with moderate MR as compared to cabbage and repair the mitral valve, the long-term outcome is still no different. So they would say that isolated cabbage is still the treatment and just monitor this patient later on for the progression of MR. In the cabbage group, they say that you do cabbage and mitral valve replacement because it will depend on the on the myocardium that you can recruit. If there are some scarred area, then you know that doing cabbage alone with NB, cabbage alone with severe scarring will not improve the uh, LV geometry. So they say that you have to repair your mitral valve. But in the other group for isolated cabbage, they would just say that if you have a big area of myocardium at risk and you can recruit them, then doing cabbage alone will uh, decrease the ischemic burden on the papillary muscles and on the LV and just decreasing your, your MR. So I think uh, for for uh, ischemic MR, moderate ischemic MR, um, I think you still have to go for a heart team approach, whether you want to do isolated cabbage or isolated or cabbage plus, my, plus mitral valve replacement. So um, studies demonstrated that improvement in MR in patients with moderate mitral regurgitation who underwent isolated cabbage was limited to patients with viable myocardium in the absence of the synchrony between papillary muscle. So if you don't have lots of viable myocardium, you undergo cabbage and you have a mitral valve replay, uh, moderate MR, they suggest you might as well change the mitral valve because this will not improve just with isolated cabbage. And persistence of the MR may even progress and increase your mortality in the future. Uh, recent RCTs, moderate and severe ischemic MR and um, mitral valve replay, repair or replacement with cordial sparing failed to achieve long-term favorable effects on clinical outcome. But subgroup analysis demonstrate favorable reverse remodeling. So I think these are patients who still would need more studies in, uh, to see whether really uh, touching the mitral valve with uh, valve cordial sparing would be uh, beneficial rather than do, just doing cabbage. For moderate ischemic MR, yeah, de uh, decision is affected by your echo parameters, your ejection fraction, your, the risk, whether cabbage plus MBR will pose a greater risk, and the synchrony and fibrosis in your myocardium. Uh, Mitral valve replacement or repair after previous cabbage. Um, sometimes if they, they have a residual MR after cabbage and the patient is hemodynamic, if it's mild or moderate, they do not touch it and just put them on medical treatment. Uh, there's one case study that I want to share. This is a, a clip. They call it an eclipse MR, transient severe MR. An 83 female, uh, normal EF, no valvular heart disease. Every time she'd go into chest pain, you do the echo, their severe MR. And then when the chest pain disappears, the MR will disappear. And they did several angiograms in this patient. Um, 
a patient uh, would have normal coronaries. And uh, they treated this patient with just uh, mononitrates and calcium antagonists, which improves the MR. But unfortunately, this patient died. And when they did the autopsy, they, did, they found a subendocardial infarction with hemorrhage in the anteroceptal wall. So this is a very rare case. Another case report that I've come across is that it's a 57-year-old male, STEMI. Uh, apparently at the ER had um, an anterolateral wall. They did an angiogram. The culprit was a dominant circumflex. They performed the angioplasty very well. After this two days, the patient developed chest pain and a moderate MR. So they did a echo and found out that there was stuttering of the mitral valve. They did a look at the coronary angiogram. Uh, they found out that there was stent thrombosis. So they just opened up the uh, coronaries again, uh, make sure they plastered the stent very well, and the MR disappeared. Um, transient MR after severe mitral, after mitral valve replacement is associated with clinical outcome. There's only case series. Uh, Post-operatively, they detected some or MR post-op were successfully managed medically with good short and long-term uh, outcome. So uh, re-intervention or bringing this patient back to the OR is associated with poor outcome. So after repair, if you have residual MR, they just go for GDMT. The role of mitral clip for uh, ischemic MR is still limited. Uh, I, there are some um, institutions that do a mitral clip for acute MR in patients with ACS, but I think Dr. Kang has uh, stated there's still it's still not in the guidelines uh, for 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 this type of patients. So in conclusion, ischemic MR significantly impacts the outcome and prognosis of CAD cases. Revascularization is still superior to OMT in CAD with ischemic MR. Decision for cabbage and PCI would vary. It depends on so many factors. For severe MR uh, patients with ACS, I would suggest that you go for surgery. Uh, but for patients with moderate, mild MR, hemodynamically stable, acute coronary syndrome, you just open the culprit vessel. IMR can improve, it may not change or even progress after revascularization. So in patients whom you perform PCI or even cabbage with residual MR, these are patients you have to monitor very closely for the progression of your myocardial infarction or myocardial regurgitation and put this patient on adequate heart failure regimen. Uh, decision is hardest for moderate IMR. Two proponents, revask alone or revask with replacement. Uh, most evidence would show superiority of revask alone and observe IMR, but I think there is no uh, big data to, to make this a uh, sweeping statement. So I think it would still be best to discuss it with the heart team once you have this situation. Most evidence that we have are retrospective studies, a lot of small studies with diverse revascularization, this is still considered a gap in knowledge. We need stronger studies to be able to provide us and guide us uh, in our treatment. And with this, I thank you very much. That's great lecture, Dr. Estacio. Uh, great lecture, all covering the whole aspect of the ischemic matter regurgitation with a beautiful slide. <laughs> and uh, in my in my experience, because I'm an interventional cardiologist, uh, acute ischemic MR accompanied with a STEMI is a DJ after. Usually, we, uh, after the in shock patient, after very busy uh, PCI, then we found we find that the patient has acute severe MR with the coda rupture or papillary muscle rupture. Then we send the patient to the surgery, surgical room. Yes. And I think that in that situation, the patient in shock and just received PCI and your antiplatelet the high degree of the, the high dose of the heparin. And in those situations, mitral 
clip would work, what is your personal opinion? There's no data yet. Yeah, there's Only no data. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I well, my ex our experience here is really yeah. very very limited. I think uh, yeah. we just had four clips because the patient cannot afford. But I think this is one area where uh, mitral clip can be studied. But the problem is if you have cordal rupture, uh, do you think? I, I don't think mitral clip will be able to help us. Uh, the yeah. surgeons would would definitely just do valve replacement outright and um, for me if uh, the patient is in shock and we've done everything in the cath lab i think we have to share our problems with the surgeon and um, especially in patients with uh, severe mr but if we are doing our culprit pci develops mr in say in the icu hemodynamically stable maybe at moderate mr uh, maybe we can just observe this patient and uh, treat them and follow them up closely in the future. And if the MR progresses, then I think uh, you would have more relaxed time doing your mitral clip. But I, I, I don't like to do mitral clip in a very stressful situation. Maybe just give it to the surgeons. Great opinion. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Estacio, for your excellent talk. I just want to share my experience for a QMR patient using mitral clip. We have done, I think, few cases of uh, Meta clip in this situation, I think it's doable, but the uh, only concern is the uh, left atrial dimension because uh, uh, for the meta clip therapy, you know that uh, the uh, transeptal point would be 4 or 4.5 centimeter, but in this situation, the left atrial, left, left atrial dimension is normal. You cannot get the 4 or 4.5 as a recommend. Usually, you get the uh, 3.5 or at as much 4 centimeter. You need to do some uh, gaining high procedure to get uh, some high and, and you would get a good uh, result from this. We have done, I think, two or four cases, uh, two, three or four cases of uh, acute uh, MR using MetaClip when I was a fellow at Sida Sinai and in Thailand also. Uh, sometimes you need you need some support like Impela or IBP or ECMO during the procedure. And after the procedure, uh, most of the patient uh, recovery very, very well and so quick. Uh, the ECMO or Impella can be removed in next one or two days. That, that's my comment and my experience for share. Thank you. Uh I have a comment. Uh, I know we are running uh, very uh, already short of time, but uh, I really congratulate uh, Ronaldo for a, his nice presentation. But uh, basically, it's not black and white. Uh, say, for example, we are looking at patient 3 a.m. in the night, and we do a primary infeval MI. Somebody did an echo and say moderate MR. Even uh, it's not clearly what's going on. Definitely, uh, that patient has been proceed for primary angioplasty. In the morning, it's clear that uh, there is a cardi rupture. Now, surgeon is very reluctant to take that patient. In guidelines, it's very easy to put things black and white. But practically, clinically, it's very difficult scenario. But what is our experience by putting a stent opening artery? Definitely, there is a reduction in mitral regurgitation unless there is no structural issue. But if uh, there is a cardi rupture or some other problems, then it's very difficult to manage it only by opening the vessel. Uh, Dr. Dr. Sue, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. some opinion as a surgeon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know that uh, in patients with the acute myocardial infarction, there are several factors can induce the Severe muscle regurgitation. Uh, in the in the extreme example is the papillary muscle rupture. For patient with papillary muscle with acute myocardial, but uh, after myocardial infarction, there is no way to do the mitral clip mm. for that because during the operation you can see the 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 papillary muscle uh, disruption and uh, invert to the left atrium. There is no place for the mitral clip to, to repair that. This is the the first question. And for the ischemic MR in patient with 
coronary artery disease, my opinion, my, my personal uh, treatment strategy is that uh, if the patient have good pocket vessel and uh, abundant of uh, viable myocardium, even patient has a severe MR, you can do cabbage alone because the, the, the addition of mitral valve surgery to isolated cabbage, the operating mortality will increase. So if the patient have very good pocket vessel and the, the viable myocardium, usually I will do isolated cabbage alone because the most of the patient will, will have the, the, the improved mitral regurgitation after surgery. If the patient have chronic history of heart failure and uh, also the scar myocardium, then you have to consider the combination of cabbage and the mitral valve repair. Uh, for the mitral valve intervention in ischemia MR, personally, I prefer the mitral repair. You know, the, although the, in, in several publica previous publications showed that the, the, the replacement is better than the repair. However, you know, the, the, the mitral repair is technique dependent. You have to learn how to repair the ischemia MR, not to replace the valve with uh, not durable in the valve. You know, so I personally, yeah. I always do the mitral repair in yeah. for the functional MR. Yeah. I, I think uh, Dr. Shu is right. If you are very good in doing the repair, I think you should repair a, a, a MR. Uh, but having said that, if um, our system does not provide a patients going back, so we tell our surgeons, if you cannot do a repair properly, might as well change the valve. So I think I agree with Dr. Shu. The mitral valve repair is technique dependent and operator dependent. Mm -hmm. You're right. Greatest question. Yeah, greatest question for the very difficult and hard issue. But because of the time limit, I will uh, we will proceed to the last lecture from the Dr. Christina Mimuk from Thailand. He is a clinical instructor of the Division of Cardiology in Lam Tham T Body Hospital and Mahidol University, Bangkok, Thailand. He will talk about another very difficult and but important issue of the decision making and measurement of similar MR in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Dr. Mimu, please. Thank you, Dr. Kang, for your kind uh, introduction and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My today talk is about uh, my today talk is about uh, management of mitral regurgitation in a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient. It is my disclosure. Uh, let's start with the case presentation. Uh, this is a 65 years old female with known uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy oh, with my I'm, MR. I'm so sorry, but yeah, I uh, cannot see your slides. Yes. Oh yeah, oh, sorry. So, so, sorry, sorry. Yeah, let me stop sharing and could share it again. Can you, it's moving? Yeah. It's mov okay, yeah. okay. Let's start again. Yeah, let's start with the case presentation. This is a 65 years old female with a known uh, hypertrophic cardiopathy with a MIMR. She presented to another hospital with a certain disc nearby having run for a week. On the examination, the Holocytic murmur can be heard at the apex. On the chest X-ray, you can see the cardiomegaly with pulmonary congestion. The left finding show elevation of hyper, uh, high centroponin T and also uh, NT bobin P level. I was consulted from my half year colleague for being considered transcranial treatment for this patient. The ECG show normal synaptic rhythm with the uh, LV hypertrophy with uh, strain pattern. The echocardiogram performed at my hospital, you can see the concentric hypertrophy with a significant MR and later moderate to severe right here. And the LVOT gradient uh, was measured uh, showing that about 52 of the gradient across the LVOT. The eject, obstruct and leak concept has been widely accepted 
at the cost of uh, mitral regurgitation in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient, but other factor like a papillary muscle abnormality or intrinsic mitral wall abnormality can be uh, the factor uh, can be cause of MR in HCM patient, especially in the for the cardiac rupture. It can be found in one to five percent, and it's often lead the patient to severe MR requiring a surgical or intervention therapy. The echocardiogram is useful for evaluation of the LVOT gradient, as well as SAM and degree of mitral regurgitation. And it can be detect the intrinsic mitral valve uh, abnormality and also the mitral regurgitation direction. If uh, the information from the transtoxic echo is not clear, the esophageal echo is an optional. For our patient, uh, because we cannot identify the exact pathology for of the MR in the patient, we, perf uh, we decide to perform the uh, TEE. You can see the SAM right here, citric anti-emotion causing the LVOT obstruction and also the uh, mitral regurgitation. On the right panel, you can see the MR has two jets. One is a posteriorly directed jet. If you see the posteriorly directed jet MR in SCM patient, it's likely to be a SAM related MR. But if you see a, a central jet or even anteriorly directed jet like this patient, the intrinsic mitral valve abnormality should be sought, like a prolapse or caudal rupture. In this patient, you can see the, the MR has uh, two ways. On the uh, bypass system, you can see the caudal rupture of the P3 segment. So in this patient, the MR came from two mechanisms. One is a anterior septal jet MR from the pale, failed P3. And another mechanism is a, a posteriorly directed jet MR from caudal and limbless SAM. Because to, this patient has to make a uh, mechanism of the MR. Corrine angiogram and rape heart catheterization is also useful in evaluation of the Corrine anatomy, including a septal branches for a septal ablation candidate. And the degree of a LVOT obstruction can be measured by this invasive method. Back to our case, we performed the Corrine angiogram. You can see the CAG show the non obstructive disease. And you can see multiple septal branches one, two, three, four, five, and also the septal beating of all proximal septal, one, two, three, four, five. We perform the LV gram. You can see the LV kissing uh, during the systole, and also MR was severe, and you may appreciate the SAM right here. We uh, calculate the lasting LVO3 gradient, that's what uh, 65, millimeter mercury and uh, on the pullback you can see the gradient uh, occur uh, at the level below the LVOT. What should we do for this patient? Send the patient for surgery to do a myectomy alone or do the myectomy and mitral valve surgery or do the send the patient to do the pacemaker implantation or a cause septal ablation or as we talk uh, a lot today, is translator edge to edge repair for the patient. The septal reduction therapy is the gold standard for treatment of the hypertrophic cardiopathy with MR because it can reduce the LVOT gradient and improve the outcome, short and long term outcomes compared to non intervention obstructive individual. And also, the mitral valve surgery can be uh, concomitantly performed in whole compassion uh, by uh, shorten elongated anterior leaflet or do the papillary muscle release or relocation or even do the mitral valve repair or replacement for treatment of the leaflet pathology. The extended septal myectomy perform uh, transaortically is can be solely done with our mitral valve surgery if absent of uh, intrinsic mitral valve disease and extended septomectomy is properly performed, the surgeon can uh, exist the uh, uh, muscle from the septum up to the apex if 
is performed properly, you, uh, the mitral valve should not be touched. This is the outcome study of my ectomy. It's long-term outcome for 10 years from the Mayo Clinic. You can appreciate the back tick line. Right here is the my ectomy patient. Uh, in the my ectomy patient, there's a comparable outcome to the non-obstructive patient. But if you look at the non-operated obstructive patient, uh, they has uh, the worst outcome compared to two subgroups. The concomitant septal myectomy and mitral valve surgery should be considered in the Holcomb patient with the uh, intrinsic mitral valve disease, especially CVMR from mitral valve prolapse or even a cordial rupture like uh, our patient. Uh, for the recombination, mitral valve repair is recommended over valve replacement if it's uh, possibly performed. Another option is the accord septal ablation. This is a transcatheter less invasive selective alcohol induced myocardial infarction at the septal branch lead to uh, decreasing of the septal hypertrophy and uh, LVOT gradient. This is the outcome from the Mayo Clinic again for in 2,200 patients uh, compared uh, myectomy and alcohol septal ablation. At the four-year follow-up, you can see in the all patient the myectomy has a comparable to the uh, alcohol septal ablation in terms of survival free of death and severe symptom. But if you look at the patient is less than uh, 65, you can see the myectomy has a better outcome compared to the uh, alcohol septal ablation alone. This is our uh, another case example for alcohol septal ablation. This is a uh, 60. 69 years old female uh, with other of uh, systemic sclerosis with interstitial lung disease. She, she was diagnosed with uh, Holcomb for a few years with a resting LVOT gradient of 75 and a moderate MR. One month before admission, she complained of the progressive shot of breath uh, with the NYHA progress from one to class three with the OMT at 100 with the 50 on the optimal dose of beta blocker. On the exam, you can hear a holocytic murmur at the apex and also at the left lower personal border. The echocardiogram, you can appreciate the SAM right here and uh, acceleration flow at the LVOT and also a moderate MR. The LVOT gradient was uh, 23 of the peak pressure. Because, uh, because her age and uh, comorbidity, including the in, uh, interstitial lung disease, we decide to perform uh, alcohol septal ablation. Uh, after we select uh, first septal band, we inject the contrast echo right here. You can see the brightness of the echo contrast at the septum at the area of interest that we use to abrade. After that, absolute alcohol 1.2 millimeter milliliters was injected using the over the wire balloon. This is the outcome after a concept of ovation. You can appreciate the gradient now is gone near to zero. Uh, this is a, a 30 minute procedure. You can appreciate the reduction of the LVOT gradient from almost 100 to the zero is uh, dramatically reduced in this patient. We perform a uh, echo at six months because the, the guideline recommend to perform echo at three to six months after the procedure to irritate the, the gradient. Now it's gain is gone. The peak pressure gradient is about uh, 15. And if we can compare the echo images to the before the procedure, after the procedure, you can appreciate the thinning of septal myocardium and also the hypokinesis of the septal wall that lead to decreasing in the LVOT obstruction. Another option is uh, dual chamber pacing. The dual chamber pacing is, can reduce the gradient compared to the baseline and uh, possible they, they, they open mode AAI uh, after push the uh, dual chamber. Uh, DDR pressing, DDD pressing can reduce the gradient by about uh, 30 millimeter mercury, but it failed to show benefit in terms of uh, functional cast improvement by using a treadmill exercise test. So now it's uh, not 
in the US guideline recommendation anymore for dual chamber pacing. There are some limitations of the septal reduction therapy. As you know that the surgical myectomy or alcohol septal ablation has been shown to be effective for reduction of the LVOT gradient or the, and improvement of the MR. But they are increasing the risk of uh, cardiac arrhythmia, medical septal defect, and, and the heart block requiring pacemaker implantation, especially in the alcohol septal ablation. And they cannot be performed in the patient with elevated surgical risk or the septal endotomy is not feasible to do the alcohol septal ablation. Another potential therapy for this is uh, to use the tan catheter edge to edge repair using the meta clip because uh, the meta clip can treat the SAM and the EMR and LVOT obstruction with the one device. We have one case of the our uh, SCM patient. This is a 78 years old female. Uh, she was diagnosed with SCM for for a while, and she has a AICD implantation and optimal medical therapy. She was in NYHA class two, and the echo show MR was not severe. But a month ago, she presented to the emergency department with the Western heart failure and the echo show a severe MR. And now it's the MR caused by the SAM and new fail of the P2 and PT segment because her is very, very old and her functional status is very poor. So call candidate, we decide to do the uh, meta clip. Uh, this is a less than a 50 minutes procedure. You can see the outcome after one clip. Now it's MI is gone and uh, uh, SAM is gone also. If you compare the shared X-ray, this is the pre-procedure. You can see the cardiomegaly and also uh, uh, pulmonary congestion and right pleural effusion. The right, the right pleural effusion is persist for a year because the uh, heart rate cannot uh, be controlled. This is uh, the, the day one after the procedure. We put one meta clip here. And this is uh, a month after the procedure. This is meta clip. The, the heart is reduced inside and there's no more heart failure and right pleural effusion is gone also. The initial experience of using metacrip in this uh, patient, in Hokkam patient, uh, this is a report review from Sida Sinai group. They included the patient, 15 patients from four study. You can see the LVOT gradient is uh, down dramatically from 40 to 100, and after the procedure is only less than 20. And also the MR severity is came down to one, zero or one in most of the patient. And the NYSA class uh, from the baseline is uh, most of the patient has a class three or four. And then after the procedure, uh, the, the NYSA now is a one or two only. The patient has improved both symptom and LVOT gradient and also the MR. The advantages of using the meta clip in whole compassion because uh, there is the ability of the real time assessment because you can see uh, the hemodynamic chain during the procedure because uh, this is a heart beating procedure and also you can uh, you can measure the immediate improvement of the cardiac hemodynamic parameter like a gradient and also the MR reduction before you release the clip. And this is a less invasive procedure than the uh, septomectomy, and maybe for less invasive than uh, alcohol septal ablation also. This is not the uh, anatomical, colony anatomical dependent compared to the alcohol septal ablation, and risk of permanent pacemaker is lower than uh, true, true procedure above. However, the long term outcome of using the meta clip in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient are required. Back to our case study, because the patient has a fail uh, of the pre and also the same at the A2, the wall area is very small, just three, 
uh, square millimeter, we cannot use to clip in this patient. So we send the patient for septomectomy and MVR. This is a, the uh, intra intra procedure intra procedure TE before the myectomy. You can see a uh, uh, septal kissing right here and make the uh, LVOT obstruction. This is the after the myectomy is quite uh, dramatically improved. Ne no more the LVOT obstruction. And the gradient before was a 50 and gradient after the myectomy was only uh, 16 to 18. The tantastic echo was performed on next day, the peak LVOT gradient was only eight and patient uh, rapidly recovery and she can go home in a week. This is my decisive algorithm for the patient with a whole come with a MR. If the patient is less than a 60, uh, 65 and low surgical list, I would send the patient for, uh, I was looking for the intrinsic mitral valve surgery. If yes, I will send the patient for myectomy with the mitral valve surgery, repair or replacement. If the patient has no intrinsic mitral valve surgery, uh, the patient will undergo uh, myectomy uh, alone. If the patient elderly or high surgical risk, if the septal anatomy feasible for alcohol septal operation, I would do the alcohol septal operation first. If uh, every every gradient is gone, but MR is still significant, I would do the meta cliff after that. If the septal anatomy is not feasible for alcohol septal operation, I would consider the meta clip in this kind of patient. In my conclusion, the aim of treatment of a SCM patient is to reduce LVOT obstruction and DT of metal regurgitation. The citric anterior motion of the metal valve play an important role in the SCM patient, causing the LVOT obstruction and MR. The septal reduction therapy has been shown to be effective in reduction of a LVOT gradient, as well as the improvement in the functional capacity of the patient. The concomitant MV surgery should be performed in the patient with the SCM and the intrinsic mitral valve disease or in the inadequate, uh, inadequate myectomy or adequate myectomy cannot be achieved by surgical technique. The alcohol septal ablation is effective and useful in poor surgical candidate, but it's carry some risk like an arrhythmia hand block or even a sudden death after the procedure and should be considered in the elderly patient. And the novel therapy like a meta clip is a potentially, potentially effective in reduction of OT gradient and also the MR reduction. But we need a long-term outcome study uh, for this therapy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mimo, for your excellent lecture and covering all aspects of the HACOM and MR. And do you have any other panelists have any opinions or questions or comments for his lecture? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have one, one. I have two congratulations for your excellent talk. I'm totally agree with you because the, you know, for as a surgeon, I, I, I always perform the extended septal myectomy. But when patient, the, the intellectual system is not so large and the, the, the mitral regurgitation is severe, I will perform septal myotomy and uh, mitral repair for this patient. And the technique I use for mitral repair is FVLE stitch, just like the, the mitral yeah. clip. So I, I, I do believe that the mitral clip will work in patients. Uh, with uh, Hong Kong and uh, severe MR. I totally agree with you. Thank you. Yes. Great lectures and great discussion for two hours and 15 minutes. Yeah, it was a very great time that we could fully leave you from basic to imaging and intervention and surgery of the mitral valve disease. And it was a great time and uh, can I ask Dr. Su for the closing remark for the, this great session? Yeah.
No, no. I, I think the professor can 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 do the closing <laughs> remark. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. And thank you. Thanks for joining APSC or webinar, cloud webinar for my type of disease. And please join the next webinar, maybe about the autic disease again. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank Bye. you. Yeah. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Stay safe, everybody. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.